Uh, good morning. For those of you that don't know me, I am Brad Burnsworth. And for those of you who do, I am still Brad Burnsworth. Uh, <laughs> uh, so I've been asked to give my testimony today. And so I'm going to just start into it right now. Uh, I was not raised in a Christian household. I was brought up Jewish. I went to Hebrew school, learning to read and write Hebrew, as well as learn Jewish history. All this was preparing me for my eventual bar mitzvah. Unlike most Jewish families, though, in addition to Rosh Hashanah, Yom Kippur, and Passover, I celebrated Christmas and Easter. I did not celebrate Christmas and Easter for the same reasons as Christians do. See, Christmas was about presents, and Easter, the chocolate bunnies and egg hunts. <laughs> I found out years later we celebrated those holidays because my father is Methodist. But, they have, but those holidays had no religious aspect to my family. As I got older, my mom asked me if I wanted to go through with a bar mitzvah. But I told her I did not want to, and I wanted to focus on my sports. I did not want to keep giving up time to study and learn Hebrew, and I was doing it more for a sense of pleasing my mom than for myself. I made this decision as I was being selfish and wanted to focus on me rather than pleasing God, even though I still believed in him in a general sense. This led me to a path of me and my mom only going to synagogue for high holidays and going to my grandparents for Passover. And even I stopped making an effort to go for Passover. When we moved down to Florida, I had to find new friends and as always I found friends that were Christian. But as with my old friends, they too would crack jokes about Jewish people and say things that were heartless to others. This made me continue to keep my religion a secret to most people. As the years went on, I started dating, but when some of the girls found out that I was Jewish, they would break up with me, but I wasn't sure why. But when, um, I just didn't understand what the problem was. Why does it matter I'm Jewish? One girl even stated she was sad that I was Jewish, and finally having enough, I asked her why. She stated, because I will be in heaven and you won't. I looked at her and said, hello, don't you know I'm one of the chosen people? <laughs> Obviously not knowing what I know now, <laughs> but as with the other relationships, that one too ended. A few more years passed and things were about to change. I just didn't know it yet. I met a beautiful girl at work that I was drawn to. She was so different from everyone else. She showed a genuine care for people and didn't use religion as a vehicle to destroy a relationship. I wanted to be around her and with her as much as possible. She would go to church on Sundays, and I would not at first. But one day she invited me to come with her to church, and well, that was a no-brainer. I wanted to be with her, and I was curious about this whole church thing, too. <coughs> I went with her and talked about a fish out of water. I had no clue what they were talking about especially when they were in the New Testament. I had never heard these things before. I would sit there and listen, and when they would sing, I would sing the songs, but not the Jesus part. And when they would pray, I would pray, but not the Jesus part. As we kept going, I would become more drawn in. And as the pastor was reading scripture, I would want to hear more. So I'd continue reading on, completely ignoring what the pastor was saying, but I wanted to know more. After church, I would bombard Polly with questions about what I read, like, do you believe that? Looking back on that now, that's silly of me to ask such a thing. Of course she believes it. But this was all exciting and new to me. Finally, one Sunday in church during invitation, I had a strong desire to go down and admit I was a sinner, that I believe Jesus is God's son, and confess my faith in Jesus Christ. Only problem was, I was scared to go. All these people were believers from a young age. I'm 30. I'm going to look like a fool. But I grabbed Polly's hand and went up front. I was hoping I would not have to be baptized, as for the months I was going there, I would watch all these kids get baptized, but no adults. I didn't want to be the only adult. What helped me finally get over that is when Polly told me that her stepdad was baptized at an age that was older than me, which helped me realize it can happen at any age. 
I was excited for the day to finally be here, and if there was ever a time for me to still back out, it was right then. We were in winter, and I was told the water heater went out. <laughs> so the water was ice cold, <laughs> but there was no changing my mind. After my baptism, it took me several years to tell my mom, as I was worried about what she would say. Funny part was, she, she had told me she already had a feeling, and I was just confirming that for her. I knew things would be difficult with my mom, but things have gotten better with time. My parents have come to church with me for the Christmas Eve service and Benjamin's baptism, and I continue to grow in my walk with Jesus. See, you never know how your actions will impact others. A kind word versus hurtful. Giving people a chance, an invitation to church, answering a million questions, or telling someone they should read the Bible for the answer. All of it can be a building block for that person to come to know Christ. Just look at me. Thank you. Why are you a Christian? Now, I know that some of you may not yet be, and you are the ones who may be the most interested in this message today, but most people in attendance here today would at least claim to be a Christian. So my question again is, why are you a Christian? Now, I don't mean the circumstances surrounding your decision or your age, some of those things that Brad so wonderfully shared with us today. I want you to think about why. Some are able to say, as Brad was not, I was raised in a Christian home and it was a natural step for me at some point to become a Christian. And that's great. That's the way a lot of us start out, including myself. But as we grow older, we notice that there are many, many choices out there. There are many, many worldviews. There are many, many ideas that we could believe in. Why are you a Christian? I mean, if you had been born in Israel, would you be a Jew today? If you were born in Iran, would you be Muslim? If you were born in India, would you be Hindu? If you were born in Russia during the days of the Soviet Union, would you therefore be an atheist? If you had been born in Athens, Georgia, God forbid, would you be a bulldog? <laughs> I mean, what is it about Christianity that made you decide to become a follower of Jesus. Have you thought about that? Now, if someone who is searching for passion and purpose in life came up to you and said, you know, I have some friends who are Muslim or Hindu or whatever else it might be, and they have talked to me about adopting their faith, and I'm kind of confused. Now, let me ask you, why are you a Christian? What would you tell them? Now, the Apostle Peter wrote in verses we call 1 Peter 3, 15 and 16. We've already heard these this morning. Let me repeat them. But Peter says, In your hearts set apart Christ as Lord. That's the beginning. We set him apart as, as Lord. Brad told us how he had come to confess Jesus as his Lord. Then it says this, Always be prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks you to give the reason for the hope that you have. But do this with gentleness and respect, keeping a clear conscience. And it goes on from there. An awful lot in this passage of Scripture today, it says always be ready or always be prepared. Be ready to give the reason for your faith in Christ. It says do it with gentleness and respect. That is, don't become flustered, frustrated, embarrassed, or angry. Give a well thought out, a prepared in some sense answer, even while you are respectful of the beliefs of the person you're talking to. Keep a clear conscience. By that, he means live such a good life in front of people so that it will give credibility to your words. We heard Brad talking about Polly in those terms a few moments ago. As some have put it, don't just talk the talk, but walk the walk. 
Well, you may say to me, well, Fred, let me turn the tables. Why aren't you a Christian? I'm glad you asked. I want you to know that I could give you many, many reasons, many, many answers to that question, and I could give more details if you're interested on some of the answers I'm going to give you today, but because of the constraints of time, I'm going to simply share two of the main reasons I am a Christian, a believer in, and a follower of Jesus. So in some senses, this will be more like my personal story, more than a, a sermon, even though we've looked at this passage and we're jumping out of that. But why I am a Christian instead of an atheist, a Muslim, a Jew, a Hindu, a Buddhist, an animist, a materialist, a hedonist, or something else? Why am I a Christian? The first reason I'm a Christian is because it's true. Because it's true. I read an article some time ago that quoted the pastor of one of the largest churches in America, a man who happens to pastor in the Atlanta area where I've lived most of my life. And when asked about his particular style of preaching, he said, people are not looking for truth, they're looking for happiness. Now I guess he's right about that for, for most people. And maybe that's why I'm different from so many people, because I am seeking for what is true. But we must define what we're talking about even then. We hear people today say, well, that may be true for you, but it's not true for me. I am living by my truth, and you have to live by your truth. Now, yet their truth may be diametrically opposed to someone else's truth. But that's okay with them as long as you let them live out their truth and don't try to convince them that whatever they choose may not be right by an objective standard. Your truth, in other words, cannot call into question their truth. That's what our society says today. Now Pontius Pilate, the Roman governor who reluctantly agreed to sentence Jesus to death, asked Jesus during his trial, if you remember when Jesus spoke about truth, he said, what is truth? Many would have that same cynicism today about a search for truth about whether truth even exists as a reality. But the Bible says that Jesus came full of grace and truth. He claimed that the Word of God is truth. He said about himself, I am the way and the truth and the life. He said that he came into the world to testify to the truth and that everyone on the side of truth listens to him. Jesus said the truth will set you free. That's what I want in life. I want to know the truth. There are many today who don't really want the truth. They don't really care. They just want something that gives them some psychological help in life, whether it's true or not. Some today say they no longer believe that Christianity is, is really true, the story of it, but for whatever reasons, and most of the time they're sentimental reasons because of a, a connection from the past to now, they still want to say for some reason, in some sense, that they're Christians. Rather than facing the challenges they have to their faith, whether those challenges come from science or philosophy or from wherever, they say that Christianity is just a myth that helps give meaning to an otherwise meaningless existence. They may go on to say that religion, whether it's Christian or anything else, helps people psychologically get through tough times. And so one's as good as the other if it has meaning for you. Now, it's amazing to me how many people who identify as Christians today say things like this. I think often we've been intimidated by science or philosophy, or we've been intrigued by other forms of spirituality that we've heard of that seem different to us. Some have given up on the notion that Christianity is somehow really the truth. To summarize one Christian author today, God is nonsense. Don't try to understand faith in any real sense. Just believe it anyway. He says believe it because it helps you cope. It helps you go through those tough times in life. But I assume that if you thought putting a, a pin in your ear would help you cope, <laughs> or wearing a new outfit, or adopting another philosophy would help you make it through life and help you be happy, then, then you should go with that instead. The idea... 
that there's a God out there gives comfort to a lot of people. If it does so for you, adopt it. If not, no problem. That's your truth. Now, I'm sorry, but I can't go there. If Christianity is not true, if it's not real, I say let's leave it behind. We've got better things to do with our time. Let's be brave enough to face the truth no matter what it is. By the way, I'm not original and I'm not alone in that thinking. The Apostle Paul said, in essence, when he's writing to the church in in Corinth, he says, in essence, if Christianity is not really true, if there is no hope of God, if there's no hope of resurrection, if Jesus did not really die for us on the cross, that we might be forgiven of our sins and give us the gift of eternal life, to quote him, he says, let us eat, drink, for tomorrow we die. He went on to say, if only for this life we have hope in Christ, we are to be pitied more than all men. Now Paul, who's one of the most prolific authors in our New Testament, he's clear. If Christianity is not truth, if Jesus did not die for our sins, if he was not raised to life again, let's abandon it and just live for pleasure the few years we live on this earth. And I could not agree more. That would be where the truth would take us. But I am a Christian. And why am I a Christian? Because it's true. Well, how do you know it's true, Fred? There's so many religions out there. There's so many worldviews and ceremonial thoughts. How do you know it's true? Well, let me share with you the way I come to understand that. First, it claims to be true. Now, please understand, I know that doesn't make it true. But... That's where we start. That narrows it down a lot. When I am speaking of truth, I am speaking about the answers to the basic, deep questions of life. Questions such as, who am I? Where did I come from? Is there a meaning in life? And if so, what is my purpose here? How do I fit into this world? Is there life after death? Is there a God? And if so, what is my relationship toward Him? Those are the kinds of questions we're seeking truth about. And if we want to find truth in whether it exists, it seems logical that the first place to start is with those who claim to be the truth or who claim to know the truth. And we find that certainly in the pages of Scripture. Over and over the Bible says, Thus says the Lord. It speaks with authority. It speaks of truth. I've already mentioned how Jesus came full of grace and truth, how he claimed to be the way and the truth, how he spoke of God's word as truth, and how he said if we would abide in his words, we will know the truth, and the truth will set us free. Christianity, or faith in Christ, claims to be truth. It says the Bible, the written Word of God, and Jesus, the living Word of God, are ultimate truth. These provide the answers to the deepest questions of life. And we can accept that or reject it, but it claims to be the truth. So we begin with its claim of truth. If something claims to be true, we can check it out, can't we? And that's the next step of arriving, uh, for me, at, at the idea that Christianity really is true. I found that it is observed to be true from a human perspective. Now, let me give you just a couple of examples. We could spend all day on this. But Christianity, for instance, claims that God is a mighty creator, that we are not here by chance. Now, let's say that you're walking in the woods in late spring, and you come to a clearing where there is a nice rectangular plot of ground about 20 by 40 feet. There are no grass or weeds growing up in this plot of ground. The dirt is laid off in straight lines. Plants are coming up at regular intervals. Now, what would you surmise if you came upon that? Now, you don't have to be the the brightest crayon in the box to realize somebody has planted a garden here. We can tell because we can see the design of it. Things like that don't just happen. 
You could tell by the design. You could tell that this did not happen by chance. And similarly, when we consider our universe, our solar system, our world, and the intricacies of life, we can see because of this wonderful design that there must be an even more wonderful designer. You know, it's funny to me that Science and Christianity seemingly have been at odds in the last few decades. Did you know it was the Christian worldview that largely gave rise to the idea of modern science? Most of the early scientists were Christians because they believed in a rational God who created by a design, by a plan, much of which we can discover and therefore we can discover what's going on in this world. Since he is God, yes, he can do miracles. He can do things out of the ordinary, but he doesn't do them every moment of every day. Otherwise, we would not be able to see the design he has put into nature. But since we can't spend a lot of time here, let me just say that I really believe that when we as believers interpret the Bible correctly, and when scientists finally interpret all the data correctly, there will be no disharmony because all truth is God's truth. If your problem with faith in Christ, if your problem with Christianity is a problem with science, let me just say there are a lot of good books out there, a lot of good websites that can help you understand how there's not so much uh, disharmony as you might think. But we can observe in nature. We can observe in our own bodies an intelligent designer just as Christianity would lead us to believe we would see. But it's not just in creation. Another example is the important topic of the nature of humankind. What is man like? What is woman like? What is the truth about men and women, our nature? Now, I've got two of my children here today, uh, three if you count over uh, in the, the nursery here. I have five children or six if we count Sarah. And let me, you know, you know how I had to raise them? I had to take Hannah and Lydia here. And they were always so wonderfully sharing everything. I'd say, please be a little more selfish with your toys. Please, you know, please don't, don't share quite so easily. Uh, stand up for yourself. How many of you believe I ever had to tell them that? One person believes I had to tell them that. I did not have to tell them that. No, we teach them to share, not to be selfish. And I want to tell you something about what the Bible teaches. It teaches that we, humankind, we are made in the very image and likeness of God. And therefore, we have great potential. However, each one of us has been marred by sin. By sin in our own lives as well as sin in general. And look at the world around you and look into your own heart and life. We all struggle with sin, don't we? We all struggle with selfishness, but we all have great potential and we have abilities to accomplish great and wonderful things. Now that's exactly what we would expect given the teachings of the Bible. Now I could go on and on. I'm not saying there are no areas of reality that I do not understand. But all that I do understand points to the Christian worldview as truth. But even more importantly, God has provided proof. You see, some people speak about having a blind faith. We hope we get it right. There may not be any rational reasons to believe, but we should believe anyway. Now I want you to know the Bible speaks with, about the absolute necessity of faith. But the Bible knows nothing about anything resembling blind faith. It speaks of a reasonable faith, and, and the Scriptures talk about God giving us proof. You see, God knew that there would be many counterfeits that would pop up, and so He said, in essence, if you will look with an open heart and an open mind, I will provide proof for you of the truth. Not with emotionalism, but with reason as well as spiritual understanding. Now, many of the proofs consisted of well-documented eyewitness accounts of, uh, as well as uh, miraculous signs and wonders we see in Scripture. 
probably some of those things that Brad asked Polly if she really believed in that kind of stuff. But Jesus said to those listening to him one day, if you don't believe my words, believe on account of the miracles that you've seen me do. Let me read a few passages of scripture to to make my point about how God has provided proof for us and we don't have a blind faith, uh, but a, a reasonable faith. In Galatians chapter 1, verses 11 and 12, he says this, I want you to know, brothers, that the gospel I preach is not something man made up. I did not receive it from any man, nor was I taught it. Rather, I received it by revelation from Jesus Christ. Paul said, you know, I got it straight from from God. You remember the road to Damascus and all these kind of things. Uh, In in 2 Peter, we see Peter speaking this time. And he says in uh, 2 Peter 1, beginning in verse 12, he says, So I will always remind you of these things, even though you know them and are firmly established in the truth you now have. I think it is right to refresh your memory as long as I live in this tent of the body because I know that I will soon put it aside as our Lord Jesus Christ has made clear to me. And I will make every effort to see that after my departure, you will always be able to remember these things. And then he comes to what he wants him to remember. We did not follow cleverly invented stories. When we told you about the power and coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. But we were eyewitnesses of his majesty. For he received honor and glory from God the Father. When the voice came to him from the majestic glory. This is on the Mount of Transfiguration as you might understand. Saying this is my son whom I love. With him I am well pleased. We ourselves heard this voice that came from heaven. When we were with him on that sacred mountain. Paul, Peter, both talk about eyewitness accounts. We were there. We're not making up stories. Listen to what the Apostle John says in 1 John chapter 1, beginning in verse 1. That which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked at and our hands have touched, this is, this we proclaim concerning the word of life. The life appeared, we've seen it and testified to it, and we proclaim to you the eternal life which was with the Father and has appeared to us. We proclaim to you that we, what we have seen and heard so that you may also have fellowship with us. And our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. John also speaks of, uh, to those who believe said that, said that Jesus just appeared spiritually. He said, no, we touched him, we saw him, we felt him. We were there. This was real. This is truth. And one more, in Acts chapter 17, Luke records a sermon that that Paul preaches to the folks in Athens. As you know, they were very much philosophers. And so he goes through this uh, wonderful passage of Scripture that we'll look at on another occasion. But toward the end, in chapter 17 of the book of Acts, beginning in verse 29, He comes to the tail end of this sermon. He says, therefore, since we are God's offspring, we should not think that the divine being is like gold or silver or stone, an image made by man's design and skill. In other words, they had all these idols they worshipped. He said, that's not the way it is. That's not the truth. And here he comes in the next part. He says, in the past, God overlooked such ignorance, but now he commands all people everywhere to repent, that is to turn away from their sins and turn toward the one true God. For he has set a day when he will judge the world with justice by the man he has appointed. Who is this man? He has given proof of this to all men by raising him from the dead. I don't know if you've noticed, people don't rise from the dead every day. This was the ultimate proof God offers proof to those who seek him. And the grandest proof of all is the resurrection of Jesus Christ after his crucifixion. The one who was dead was alive again. Over 500 eyewitnesses saw the risen Jesus. After this proof was given and God's Holy Spirit came to indwell in the life of believers, the world was turned upside down. The world was changed. So I am a Christian First of all, because I am convinced that it is true. But I am also a Christian because it works. Because it works. I love truth 
But I also want something that works for life, something that brings peace, love, and joy to my existence. I saw a cartoon not too long ago. One man is speaking to another. Oh, there's nothing like getting up at 5.30 a.m., jogging eight miles, coming home to a cold, brisk shower before breakfast to keep you in shape. The other man says, wow, that's amazing. How long have you been doing that? He says, I start tomorrow. <laughs> Another man outlines all the great plans he has to enjoy life. He's going to start with a worldwide cruise. Oh, really? When do you leave? As soon as I win the lottery. You know, we have to have something that works. Yes, I love the truth, but I also want something that works. And I have found in my own life that faith in Jesus delivers what it promises. Someone has said about faith in Jesus, it's not true because it works. It works because it's true. I want you to know that you can find some things out there will work for you. They'll make you feel happy. They'll make you feel pleasurable for a while. These things are not true, but they will work for you. I want something that's true and it works. There are some things that will bring you happiness for a while, but they will leave you empty-handed probably in the here and now and absolutely surely for eternity. You see, the truth of God tells us that we are all eternal creatures. We will live forever. We don't have a choice about that. It's the way we were created. The question is, where we will spend eternity and with whom will we spend it? It's amazing to me that we are told today people don't want to hear about heaven anymore. They don't want to think about eternity. Many don't believe in the idea of life after death. And yet, they struggle so hard to just have one more day of life here on earth. They want to have eternal life. They just want it on earth. Now stop and think about that. We live on an earth that is sinful. And they want to live forever here. And God offers eternity in heaven where there is peace and safety and security and perfection. And more importantly, God is there forever. Which sounds more attractive to you? Don't be misled. Now, what are some of the things about Christianity that make me say it works? Now, again, time forbids me to share all the things that God has done and is doing and will do for me. But let me just list a few. I've received forgiveness from past sin. Because of that, I don't have to waste time with guilt hangover. My sins have been cleansed. I can move on. Hallelujah for that. We don't have to take the past along with us all the time. I have freedom from anxiety. I no longer have to be a worrier because believers are invited. We are invited to cast all our cares on God because He cares for us. Now, when I find myself worrying, I realize He's told me I don't have to worry. And I go to Him and I receive the peace that He promises. It works for me. I can testify to that. I have a dynamic relationship with the living God, not because of anything I've done, but because He has invited me. He's invited me to come pray to Him. In the very throne room of God, I can go and pray to Him, and I can tell Him what's on my heart. I can ask for things. He listens, and He answers. It works. He gives me the discipline and power to change. Once I had a terrible problem with anger, I'm sure that someday I'll tell you how my anger could pop up at the worst possible time, such as during my geometry final in high school in 10th grade. God has shown me a better way and has given me the power to change. God gives me boldness for new ventures. I like to just sit back if I can and just do what I can. But he says, sometimes you need to step out there, and he gives me the boldness to do that. God gives me a love for him and a love for others. In other words, if we try to sum it up, Christianity, that is, putting it in a better way, followers of Jesus Christ, following Jesus Christ, placing my faith in Him, He gives me the power for living. He gives me power to change. You can be different than you are. Scripture says if anyone 
If anyone is in Christ, he's a new creation. The old has passed away. Everything becomes new. It doesn't just work for me. I could call up dozens of people right now from out of this room to come and testify to the power of God in their lives. And the most successful program ever for dealing with addictions is a thing called Alcoholics Anonymous. Why does it work? The original 12 steps, go back and read the original book. They're built on Christian principles that come right out of the Bible. Christianity, faith in Christ, works. I've seen it work in my life, and I've seen it work in the lives of so many others. I know a man from the first church I pastored who was molested as a child. He considered both murder and suicide as an adult, yet he was changed. He was changed by the power he found in Jesus Christ when he became a Christian. It works For me, it worked for him. And I want you to know something. It will work for you. Jesus will give you freedom from your past. He will give you power for your present. And he will give you hope for your future. That's what Jesus Christ can do for your life. Why am I a Christian? Because it's true and because it works. And these are just two of the reasons why you should be a Christian too. If you'll give God an honest chance, you'll find that Christianity is true. And if you'll give him time to produce the fruit of his spirit in your life, you'll find that it works. He will give you power for living. He does not promise freedom from troubles, but the power to overcome your troubles. And he will give you beyond all this the gift of eternal life. Living with him and others who love him forever and ever. I started this message by asking the question, why are you a Christian? Perhaps the better question for some of you today is, why aren't you a Christian? It's true and it works. Give him a chance to prove it. Start today. What do you have to lose? If you seek God through Jesus to see if it's all about it, and you decide that I'm wrong, you'll only waste a few weeks or a few months of your life. But if you discover that what I'm saying today is right, you will discover the real truth about life, not only for this life, but for all eternity. Will you reach out to God through faith in Jesus right now? You can say, God, I know that you created me in your image. I can see that in me, yet I also know that my life has been marred by sin. I believe that Jesus died on the cross as a sacrifice for my sins to bring me forgiveness. I know that you raised him, and I believe that you raised him from the dead, Father, as proof that you have given to me that we can have eternal life. And so right now, I want to confess Jesus as my Lord and leader. Please accept me into your family as your child. And if that is the desire of your heart today, I ask you to let us know of your response because we, the church, is the family of God and older members of the family help younger members of the family to grow just like it is in a natural family. I encourage you to place your faith in Jesus today and you can let us know through your response card, your response so that we can follow up And show you how not only is faith in Christ true, but how it works in our lives. Let's pray. Father, thank you that you are the truth. And that Christianity is true. And that you give us power for living how it can work in our lives. We pray all this in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen.